I'm going to get started. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Alyssa Bronstein, and I am the editor of Feminist Economics. Uh, we just, I just took over uh, um, over the summer after a couple of years of overlap with Diana Straussman, our founding editor, so it feels a little odd to say that. <laughs> so it is the 25th anniversary of the journal. Uh, it was a little unclear in the, um, the listing of the panels because maybe they don't have italics, right, in the ASSA listings, but they put it in parentheses. But in fact, it should be in italics, <laughs> and it's referring to the journal, uh, not feminist economics as an intellectual project, although the journal is, but specifically as a journal. And we thought it would be a great opportunity to take some time to reflect um, on its origins and its achievements, as well as its challenges looking forward into the future. So we have a very distinguished panel uh, today who will participate in this discussion. Uh, Cecilia Conrad from Pomona College, <laughs> Gunsli Barrett from the University of Utah, Diana Straussman from Rice, also, as I said, the founding editor of the journal, Nancy Fulbray from the, Univers from the University of Massachusetts, and Carmen Diana Deere from the University of Florida. I also wanted to say that uh, one of the panelists who was supposed to be here, Abena Adoro, who's from the University of Ghana, was not able to come because she couldn't get her visa in time. You miss her. So I, I, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of how the panel is going to work. It's structured as sort of a pseudo discussion. I'm going to ask the panelists a series of questions. Not all questions will be posed to all panelists, so we'll have some differentiation here. And we've asked that the panelists keep their responses to about five minutes. Uh, and so the way we are going to enforce that is my partner, Diksha Aurora, has a little sign that says zero minutes. <laughs> so when she puts up that sign, that means you've hit your five minute mark and please uh, try to conclude, but we will come back to you. We will also have time for questions and comments from the audience after we go through some of these questions. So I want to start uh, with a question on origins to Diana on what motivated the founding of the journal. Well, thank you. It's, it's a challenge to compress into five minutes, but I will <laughs> do my best. <laughs> I do want to recognize that it was 30 years ago from this um, AEA meetings, uh, or ASSA meetings, when uh, we had the panel uh, can feminism find a home in economics? And it's so comforting to see you, Randy, in the first row there because you were there at that session. And it's still a good question. <laughs> it, it is still a good question. And, uh, and for me, I, I have a confession to make, and that is that I was trained as a mainstream economist, and I um, wrote my PhD dissertation on pricing strategies in the airline industry. Uh, is, and I really didn't think about feminism as something that I would really have to worry about just because I thought that the world had progressed. And uh, so, but it was very interesting to me to discover as a young woman economist uh, the experiences that women, when they are, there are very few of them, experience that have been documented over and over again. And so at some point I thought, like, why am I doing this work? There are lots of people who can write on this. And when I began looking into economics, I, I kind of found out, oh, well, women, these things happen because this is the way women like things. And, uh, <laughs> you know, m much of this has to do with the initial founding of IAFI. But what became very clear to me, um, and initially through my own experience, was that doing work that was basically feminist in economics wasn't seen as legitimate in the field unless it could be published in an economics journal. And 
really, there were no journals that I knew about at the time. I mean, I realized there probably were some that maybe in my kind of constricted, isolated way, I could have could have been options, but they certainly wouldn't have been on the list that my colleagues would have counted as acceptable for gaining promotion and tenure. And then I began to witness people being denied tenure all over um, the U.S. initially. I mean, I know that it's been hard in other parts of the world as well. And I thought, without a journal that's an economics journal that will publish feminist thought, we will not be able to claim that this work is important and that it's economics. And uh, so th that was, how am I doing for time? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so that was really the, the primary um, motivation that I had in really dropping everything to figure out how to strategically position a journal so that it would count as economics but so that it could publish the kinds of things that economists wouldn't permit. And I, I, so it was really intended as an intervention into the field. But I want to say that from the very beginning, I realized that with my own intellectual training and my own background, um, I wasn't necessarily the right person to imagine what the field should look like once all the other people you know beyond myself who had been excluded were let in so I've always been very reluctant to say this is what we were going to do but rather to focus on this is what our approach needs to be so that we can create a field that is diverse and welcoming and which will give create a forum for the people who have been excluded to develop the ideas that could change the world in the ways that are needed. Anyway, so I guess I'm out of time. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, second question, and this one is for Nancy. Uh, what has transpired in the field, and more generally, in the larger culture's gender-related debates since the journal began accepting submissions in March 1994? <laughs> That's a big question. I know. <laughs> I'm going to start with an old canard about the three stages uh, in the <clears throat> evolution of a new idea, or in our case, a new paradigm. Some of you have probably heard this before, but it's worth repeating. First stage, it's preposterous. Uh, why would anybody uh, want to pay any attention to that? Second stage, oh, uh, that's kind of interesting, but it's not really that important. Uh, it's kind of trivial. Third stage is, well, kind of interesting and it's kind of important, but it's totally obvious. Uh, we, we knew this all along. And um, I knew that we had reached this third stage when I went to give a talk last year at a university and a, a, a woman walked in uh, with a whole group of undergraduates wearing t-shirts that said, feminism is my favorite, oh no, feminism is my second favorite F word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I thought, I thought this was a real watershed until I saw, not long ago, a, a similar t-shirt. Football is my second favorite. <laughs> I'm pretty sure for those people, feminism was not their first favorite. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, the, big, the big change since feminist economics started is that feminism has become a, 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 a respectable word uh, in public discourse and in economics, I think. Uh, and uh, you know, in 2017, it was designated the word of the year. I tried to do a, a search, Google Ngram search, but it's not up to date. So, uh, and Ngram searches have been kind of discredited anyway. But I think it's, I think that's sort of consistent with our lived experience that that um, it's the, the the word has lost some of its um, some of its thorns. Uh, you know, it's also related very much in recent years to the pushback against sexual harassment, and I think the um, uh, incredible uh, kind of phenomenon of 500,000 tweets and 12 million Facebook posts of the Me Too movement being reflected in the discussions within our profession about sexual harassment and 
Alice Wu's paper and discussions about it in the last couple of years in the profession are also kind of very emblematic of that, of that change. The, you know, what started out as research on, on gender inequality that was very focused on discrimination has widened out. Um, it's no longer just a subset of labor economics. There is a, a very large and growing interest in gender norms and the effect of gender norms and social institutions on inequality outside of IAFI. I think that's a huge triumph and cause for uh, celebration. Um, I think there's been a big uh, empirical turn with some maybe some mixed consequences in the discipline, but from our perspective, uh, incredible success in developing new data sources uh, or pushing for and exploiting new data sources on the distribution of wealth, gender and wealth, uh, gender and time use, and I think most importantly, indexes of institutions, of social institutions, uh, you know, measures of empowerment, measures of uh, patriarchal institutions, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that is a really big thing that um, has been happening both in the journal and in the field in general. Uh, bargaining is now a big part of the disciplinary vocabulary. The unitary household model is just bye-bye. Um, uh, maybe still a little clinging to uh, Pareto optimality and uh, kind of general equilibrium false consciousness. <laughs> uh, but uh, a lot at the same time, a lot of development of uh, things like game theory uh, and uh, kind of uh, recognizing uh, the limitations of that uh, uh, sort of Pareto optimal uh, equilibria. Maybe even a little bit of interest in complexity theory and path dependence and synergies, spillovers, and stuff like that. I think that's a big positive change. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm almost done getting to number 10. No, number nine first. Uh, identity, uh, there's, there's now actually, it's, it's actually allowable to talk about identity and collective identity and collective action in the discipline. I think that's a big plus. And I think the, and this is the 10th thing, and maybe I'll can talk about this more later, but I think the kind of culmination of that for us uh, as kind of feminist economists is really trying to get serious about intersectionality. That um, if you think that women share some common interests and common identity and interests uh, as women, it follows that uh, we have some common interests and identities uh, that cannot be, uh, uh, that are not limited to gender. And I think, uh, this is a word that gets we use a lot, and it is used outside of the feminist economics community too. But is is still kind of not has not yet or remains to be uh, more more fully developed. Thank you. Hmm. So moving forward to achievements, uh, starting with CC, what do you see as the journal's main contributions to the discipline? I'll start with just the recognition of what Diana said was one of her goals, was providing a legitimate outlet, a recognized outlet, a credentialed outlet uh, in which people could publish scholarship that uh, in feminist economics. And so that surely has to rank number one. Um, the achievements that have been made in the short history of the journal in terms of its impact factors, in terms of its recognition as a serious outlet. I would go to the second thing for me, though, and this is actually what really brought me in to IAPI and to the journal, uh, have been the special issues. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which the special issues have kind of turned the way you do a special issue on its head in terms of academic, uh, uh, pro academic journals. My experience with other journals is that usually a special issue is kind of, of, of reactive to someone coming and saying, I'm holding this conference, I've gathered this group of people together, and I think it might be a great special issue. And, and that's one way of doing this. What I found exciting in terms of the work of the journal is to be a bit proactive. What are some areas of research that are really important uh, to the status of women, to human well-being, that would really benefit from having a feminist lens applied to them? And to use that as a way of, of generating research, getting people excited about an area, a topic that they may not have thought about before, and sometimes that can really have legs. I was thinking about that a lot last night during Cheryl's uh, presidential address about sort of an original topic that then spreads out into a much sort of larger line of research. 
Uh, it's been effective in some cases in helping to attract people like me mm -hmm. who were not necessarily had their eye on this as a discipline. Um, I was involved in uh, the one on race, gender, caste. I'm sure I'm going to get the names in the wrong order. <laughs> it was named race, gender, color, caste. Um, a special issue, and then also the one that um, I did with Cheryl on, on, on um, AIDS and HIV. Uh, I, there are just a number of those where they are still touch points. I used them when I was teaching, I used them in my teaching. So I would put that as probably um, one of the ones I would highlight mm -hmm. overall. And then the last one that I, I would highlight, um, and this again may be reflecting my own personal experience, but the way in which the journal has consciously tried to decenter a U.S. focus mm -hmm. uh, in economic research. And, and this came up yesterday in the panel um, uh, that I was on about how, will, how can economics deal with this race problem when one of the people who got and raised a question, raised it from the perspective of being someone who's international, I think he was from Uruguay, and this talking about the ways in which the, um, the curriculum, the research and everything has such a U.S. focus to it, and how do you address that? And it struck me when he spoke about the work that's gone in to consciously just think about what are the standards we want every article to adhere to, to make it so that this is a journal that is, aspires to be a global journal that someone can pick up and read without deep knowledge of the institutions of any one place and, and be able to become familiar. So I would put that as the next one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Carmen Diana, same question to you. What do you see as the journal's main contributions to the discipline? Well, yeah, that question's um, a tough one about doing like a rigorous impact analysis <laughs> that we obviously didn't have the, the time or the inclination really <laughs> to, uh, to do uh, for, for the panel. And the course for me immediately made me think, okay, what is the, the FemiCon project? That was something that in our previous emails we decided that we wouldn't really get into, mm -hmm. but it's hard. It's, it's hard to, to avoid that. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we've been able to establish is in many ways what a, a feminist econ analysis is not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we've done really well <coughs> is to reject every article that's submitted to us that only has uh, sex as a variable. Mm -hmm. And they're claiming that this is a feminist economics analysis. You know, It's not. You know, I think we all agree that um, that it takes you know a bit more you know, as a minimum a feminist perspective, which is, in my own thinking, you know, recognition of inequality, uh, recognition of power relations, um, you know, both as we study the economy and in our own dif discipline as we reflect on um, what we're using from from that. Uh, tradition. Uh, and in addition, you know, it really means delving into the, the why question. You know, we know there's inequality, but, but why? You know, it's the pursuit of trying to, to get at those substantive underlying relations that, uh, that might be explaining those results that, yes, are obvious. You know, we, we all know they're, they're there. Uh, but also, you know, the other thing that I've always so much appreciated about the journal and the association is that we're activists. You know, we're, we're not just here to study, we're here to change the world. You know, and it's that sense of purpose that we're dealing with, with you know, basic inequalities that are morally and socially wrong and that we want to, uh, to change by um, our day-to-day uh, labor, you know, which is intellectual production, um, you know, gender inequality. So that's sort of another aspect of it. it it's, it's crucial. But when we look at the bigger picture in terms of the feminist economics project, um, it is a holistic you know, view of the world. You know, it's one that, that does change the center of the analysis. You know, we're not maximizing things. We're, we're putting human well-being at the center of, of the analysis. And you know, central to doing that is integrating production and reproduction. Mm -hmm. So when I take sort of these different levels apart um, of what we've contributed about um, um, a journal, um, you know, I've already mentioned that 
I think at least as a minimum as a journal, uh, we've taken advantage of those teaching moments to suggest what a feminist um, economics analysis is not through our rejections. Mm -hmm. You know, every process of rejection mm -hmm. is a process of engagement, mm -hmm. right, with new folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they come in very assured that now that they've included the sex variable, they're doing a gender analysis. <laughs> and I think that as associate editors, um, in particular, that's been the, my role in the, in the journal framework, um, we've used that pretty well. You know, and you know, over the years, I've gotten some feedback about you know, a rejection that I wrote you know, 15 years ago, you know, that ended up influencing what else someone did, you know, did later on. I mean, that doesn't happen too often, but every so often. Um, you know, in terms of the big project, you know, there it's really, it's theoretical articles and the special issues. You know, I think the, the Sen uh, special issue really holds, a, you know, a unique spot in, in our history. Um, because that focus on the capabilities approach really did put well-being in the center of, mm -hmm. of the analysis. And, and I think for even those of us associated with the journal that you know, we, we got production and reproduction as being crucial, but not just how much we really were part of a project reformulating everything that the discipline was, was about. Um, at least for me, you know, it was a real moment of growth. Uh, reading that special issue later on and thinking about it and later uh, teaching things. Uh, you know, again, <coughs> without having done an empirical analysis, and it was, oh, okay, well, to conclude, <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, where my, my hypothesis would be that we've made the, the greatest difference intellectually is in an integration of production and reproduction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we see in the labor economics field, in the development <coughs> field, you know, along with uh, the data collection mm -hmm. that uh, Nancy already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, last uh, well, main uh, contributions. I, I'll just add one thing. I mean, I, to me, having <laughs> graduate students look <coughs> at uh, job market ads and seeing that institutions are looking for someone in the field of feminist economics, I think that is a tremendous accomplishment, and I think Diana really deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so next question, I'm going to start with Gunselli. Okay. Uh, so has the journal been an effective tool for furthering its goal of bringing underrepresented voices into economic debates, and what more can it do? Okay. <laughs> so... Um, as uh, editor from uh, 2010 to 2017, along with Diana, um, we uh, launched a sort of what we can call, I guess, a mentoring uh, process uh, in order to increase the publication chances of uh, junior uh, scholars from the global south, and um, and and that was. Uh, Partly, sort of a response to um, what we were seeing in the um, in the uh, publication process or the, in the review process of articles, where uh, largely due to inexperience, uh, some of the authors from the global south were <coughs> unable to respond to the referee reports in the first round of uh, of uh, uh, review and. Uh, either failed to resubmit when, when they got a reject and resubmit decision or when they resubmitted but they, the quality of the paper had not really changed. They were unable to interpret the, what they needed to do and so forth. So, uh, so this led to um, one particular form of, uh, of um, um, I guess support system, <laughs> and uh, and so in the 2011 and 2012 um, uh, IAFI conferences in Hangzhou and Barcelona, um, we had um, two um, 
two panels each, uh, so 16 papers total, where um, authors would be, authors from the Global South would be paired with uh, discussants, so they would have uh, dedicated discussants that would provide detailed comments on the papers, and, uh, and then that would, uh, and they would follow up with uh, written comments after the conference and then uh, encourage the paper to kind of shape up to be <coughs> submitted to the journal and with hopefully better chances of publication. So, so this was one particular set of um, uh, activity. And, uh, and then the other one was uh, kind of more invisible <laughs> in the form of um, uh, after a sort of at the point of sending out a rejection, or not rejection, but reject and resubmit letter, basically a weak paper, but we are very interested in it. Uh, at that point, we would, uh, we would, um, uh, well, I would, <laughs> uh, in 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 contact with the associate editor for the of the paper, try and identify a mentor for the paper. And uh, this would be someone from the, uh, either from the editorial board or another sort of um, senior, relatively senior feminist economist author, who, whom that I would contact and try <coughs> and get uh, to um, pair up with this author to, um, uh, to basically go through the referee reports and guide uh, to, to through revision process and read the revised paper and then give the go ahead to submit at that point I would contact the associate editor and um, say the paper is coming and it's been you know gone through this process mm -hmm. so um, of course this required the uh, consent of both the <laughs> mentor uh, uh, senior uh, feminist scholar but also the um, the author uh, there was no promise of publication but it was basically offered as an option uh, to um, to get this kind of support, and um, so so this you know what are the outcomes of that <laughs> is of course you're wondering, mm -hmm. uh, and this also happened by the way, um, and I was involved in perhaps pioneering this in early on before I became editor mm -hmm. uh, in a special issue, uh, and um, where we were. I was sort of instrumental in bringing, a, a pairing a reviewer of a paper with the author of a paper because we were interested in the publication of that paper, but it do didn't seem like the paper was going to be published. So, th so there was a co-authorship, there was a mentorship variant, so there was these these variants, and and I would say. Um, in trying to wreck my brain on this, but we had, I think, seven publications that come out, came out of this process. And uh, the 16 papers in the two IFE conferences did not, to my knowledge, end up in, in submissions. Mm -hmm. So they were you know, judged on the basis of um, abstracts that were sub submitted to the conference. Perhaps they were not, you know, to begin with, that strong papers, even though they got really detailed feedback. And uh, so um, I think in small measure we contributed through this process to, ri to the rise in geographic uh, distribution of our authorship and uh, also uh, the content in terms of more, uh, more articles from the Global South uh, appearing in the journal through this process. Okay. Uh, Cece, same question for you. Has the journal been an effective tool in bringing uh, underrepresented <coughs> voices into economic <coughs> debates? So I think as Gonzali has outlined, uh, we've had some success in terms of people from the Global South. Um, and I saw that in some of the special issues as well, where mm -hmm. in some more of an informal way, they're involved as kind of mentoring and support for rewriting papers. Um, I will say that in the first special issue that I was involved in, one of the goals was to elicit submissions from uh, people who are from underrepresented groups, and particularly in economics, but marginalized populations in the US. And we did not really succeed in that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I believe there's one paper um, in there, and it's not from an economist, which is okay, but um, the, and that is still, I believe, a concern for the journal, that the, the, mm -hmm. the project that has worked in terms of the Global South does not translate uh, to working with scholars in the U.S. Um, I think there are uh, issues with getting submissions and in trying to, to do some analysis of why that might be. Uh, we have to look at several factors, one being that 
doing work on race in the U.S. is a risky business. Having work on race and then publishing it in a feminist economics journal <laughs> may be a little bit too much risk uh, for a, a scholar of color in the U.S. Um, the, I think there are, actually I talked earlier in praise of our decentering mm -hmm. and making it more global. That is sometimes an obstacle in the sense that the writing and, and talking about racial dynamics in the U.S. is a peculiarly American, and here I will ex expand beyond the U.S., it has some uh, um, resonance in Latin America, but when people react to that frequently, the reaction is that, well, this doesn't seem like the kind of, of work that really should have a home in this global journal. So I think there's some, some ways in which people have a negative reaction to that kind of critique. Uh, it seems to be demanding even more of, of a group that already feels fairly highly uh, pressed upon. I, I think some of it also has to do with uh, the opportunities <coughs> and supply of people uh, who, are, who have the resources to do the research uh, that we are looking for. If you uh, look at the distribution of, of scholars, they are more likely to be at teaching institutions, less likely to be in R1 institutions. Uh, there are, so there are all sorts of obstacles that may come into play. But I, I, I also think going back a little bit to Nancy's comment on the intersectionality, there is a way in which that I cannot fully, I've been struggling with trying to how to articulate it. There is, I think, some need to, some need to question whether there are any points of conflict mm -hmm. in terms of the approaches that feminist economics historically takes and this concept of intersectionality that we haven't really fully fleshed out. Thank you. Carmen Diana, same question to you. How has the journal done in terms of better incorporating underrepresented voices? <coughs> Well, let me focus on the global south, mm -hmm. which has been my, my area of, of concern. And um, I'd like to share an ant or anecdote in terms of the, the very first issue of the, of the journal. I was at UMass at the time, and Nancy was my colleague with an office down the hall. And maybe six months before the first issue was coming out, she comes frantically into my office oh, no. <laughs> and says, we need a, an article you know, on Latin America or the global south, please. You know, put down everything that you're doing and write. And because you know, as that very first issue, you know, which had been, I guess, commissioned articles uh, came together, um, you know, only at the point when they were more or less in hand, uh, was there a gap. Now, they weren't and all commissioned. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, well, I don't remember the, the full story at, at this point, you know. Um, but I do remember working really hard, you know, to, to beat that, that deadline. And it's actually an article I'm very fond of. It's on the peasantry in the Yay. third world, but focused on, on Latin America. Um, well, to sort of see how far we, we've come, I did sit down and go through the first 10 years of the, the journal, it was 30 issues, uh, to see what the representation was in terms of the you know, different uh, regions of the, of the world. And it was a real struggle. It was a struggle to diversify you know, the geographic focus of the, or the content. Um, in that first uh, decade, I found only two articles on Africa, uh, five on Latin America, uh, we did a lot better on Asia, there was 12. Um, but if you put all of those together, plus the comparative articles on uh, less developed countries, it was about half the number that were just focused on the US, right? Um, I didn't do the same analysis for the last 10 years, but we're now accused by some folks within the association of being a development journal. Uh, I think that you know, that sort of summarizes, I think, the balance that we've obtained in terms of being from, um, you know, if not representative, you know, to, to really make, we have made a conscientious move to, uh, to be true to, uh, to our name of an international association concerned with international uh, issues. 
Uh, the other thing that's really interesting looking back at those first 10 years is that often you did not know what country was being analyzed until <laughs> you actually got into the tables in the methodology <laughs> section, right? It was so assumed it was the U.S., mm -hmm. right? You know, it wasn't carried in titles, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's been a long while since any AE has let that go by. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the country or the region isn't specified in the title, at least in the abstract. You know, you know, is this the Global South analysis? Is it, uh, it's in the title. It's been in the title for quite a long time by style editing policy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, not in the first 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not initially, but it was, per yeah. Because the international sure. orientation policy kicks in later. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I that think. probably reflects it directly. I'm not sure yeah. which year. No, that was, in, within the first five years we did that. Oh, that was, yeah. It took a while, though, to permeate. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah, I can give you proof of that. <laughs> <laughs> I kept finding it. <laughs> okay. Um, but... You know, we also need to think what we mean by, by diversity. You know, one is the, the focus of the, the analysis. Um, the other is the, um, the, um, the countries from which we're getting submissions, uh, which is really, you know, where is this knowledge being, being generated? And another measure would be in terms of, of nationality, you know, countries of origin. Um, um, and the fourth dimension would, of course, of course, be race and ethnicity within these different categories. And as far as I can tell, we've only been consistent in terms of data gathering, uh, in terms of country of submission. You know, in our annual reports mm -hmm. that we would get as AE editors, those would be the main mm -hmm. ones that, that I would see. We, right? we have it on published also. The no, but what I'm saying is that we don't collect information on nationality or country of origin. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. And if we look at the, the, the gender and development... Well, for, the authors. <coughs> for the authors. For the authors. Yeah. Of the authors. Right. Yeah. We have the... We have source of the... We, we know where they're based. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, yeah. their place of work. Yeah. Uh, you know, the knowledge production is taking mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, any of our... Um, authors from the Global South that are based in the U.S. You know, or the, the U.K. Uh, that are either uh, other country nationals or, or dual nationals. We don't have that information. And another measure of diversity, it really is about life experiences. You know, yes, you know, third world scholars that are in the U.S. are obviously you know, influenced by U.S. academe, the, all the uh, the norms in terms of what's counted, et cetera. But, uh, but I think life experience is, is certainly a variable that you know, is, is very important to us that we're, we're not taking into account. So we're probably undercounting what our true diversity is as a community of scholars in our publications. Thank you. So going back to you, Diana. Uh, what has been the role of the journal's editorial policies in its achievements, and how have they evolved? Thank you. So wh when I first started editing the journal, um, or, or prior to even starting the journal, I went to a conference of editors of feminist journals, not in economics. <coughs> and one of the things that struck me at the time was some of these journals never desk rejected a single paper, that every single paper was put through review. So we initially started doing that. And uh, how, however, it was one of my experiences and with one of our very first articles uh, where I had a conflict with an author, um, Barbara Bergman, whose paper, <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm probably not the only one in this room <laughs> who had a conflict with her. But um, I objected to her making a claim about um, the status of Muslim women that was not supported by a reference to a study supporting her claim. And uh, sh she point, you know, it was pointed out to me, and I can't remember if it was her or someone else, the paper had been through the reviewing process. There were three reviews that had supported publication, plus an associate editor. And then who was I, the editor? I was 
you know, just an administrator of sorts, to object to this. And I realized that everything depended on the editorial process and that it never should be just one person who is the main person. So I spent a lot of time thinking about our editorial policies. But one thing that changed after that was that every <coughs> single article we've had this policy is reviewed by a reviewer from outside North America. And um, that has, I believe, been very important towards helping eliminate some of the kind of initial, you know, status of so many of the articles being Americans and Canadians speaking to each other. In my early collaborations, earlier collaborations as a scholar, I worked with a sociolinguist who helped me learn about the ways in which people talk to each other sig signals in-group and out-group status to other people. So that was really when I came up with the idea of having the policy on orienting articles to an international audience, which um, went through, um, you know, which I proposed, associate editors had more <coughs> ideas, it went through a whole, um, you know, period of, of development. But w among the things that um, are included, you know, are you can't just cite papers by Americans. If somebody's worked on the topic from another area, those also need to be cited. Um, but also just think um, the, the idea of labeling the country of articles came up about through that. And, you know, often our, um, authors have been quite resistant to that. But, you know, I'm sort of struck by the comment you made, Carmen Diana, about, well, if it's, you know, not about the North, it's economic development. I mean, that is the resistance towards being a really, towards really recognizing that it's not just the kind of theory and lives of people in northern countries that matters, that it's really everyone, and that therefore that requires a much broader approach. Um, Gunsley was incredibly instrumental in helping us carry out a broader focus in terms of thinking about how can we bring in um, more voices. And among the things that we also began doing was tracking not just our submitters, but you know what are the who are we publishing? And in giving instructions to um, guest editors that they couldn't just publish a bunch of famous people, but they actually had to have a strategy for trying to recruit scholars from the developing world, um, which doesn't mean that special issues were necessarily successful, but that was a plan. But I mean, I wanted to, to say, I, I know I don't have a ton of time, and this is a huge area, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that as, as we, as part of our editorial strategy has been to have a more diverse editorial board and a more diverse team of associate editors. And the primary people who make decisions on articles are associate editors who pick the reviewers, who then they make a recommendation, but ultimately it, it is m more of a maintaining consistency of cross approaches. And as we have reviewers and associate editors from more diverse backgrounds in parts of the world, many of these scholars have ideas about what should be published or what shouldn't be published that might be different from those of the original founders of the journal. And you know, sometimes that might mean more papers that are not as methodologically innovative or that might be just more, more focused on very specific things. So I, I really, as we think about what makes feminist economics feminist, we need to be thinking about, are we focusing on our processes, or do we have sort of preset ideas of certain types of analyses are themselves inherently feminist and must be maintained? So I want to really um, leave it at that. I could talk a lot more about it, but I want to continue the conversation. Thank you. Uh, now to Gunselli. So here's a big one for you, too. Uh, what challenges uh, has the journal confronted, <laughs> for better or for worse? Well, I'll start with the five-minute challenge. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to highlight, um, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four challenges. <laughs> 
uh, to talk about. Uh, I'll start with the citations challenge. And um, so, as we know, as we acknowledge here, F uh, Feminist Economics Journal has been influential in, uh, in spearheading uh, feminist scholarship, feminist economic scholarship, and now uh, many uh, critical feminist ideas are mainstreamed. And, uh, and this was, of course, highlighted yesterday in Cheryl's uh, uh, presentation as well. Um, but uh, we have a, a situation where the mainstream does not cite feminist economics. And, and this is a, um, a curious issue. Uh, of course, there was the case of the 2012 uh, Journal of Economic Literature article on women's economic em empowerment, which did not cite a single journal article or a single feminist economics author who wrote on the subject. So, but it's not really limited to the mainstream, I mean, this, uh, this problem. And, and of course, there's a question of why. Um, and I think, contrary to what Nancy was saying, I think the F word still carries a stigma. And, uh, and there is still the positivist perception that, uh, you know, there is scientific research and there's political research and, you know, we're doing political research and they are, of course, in the world of science. And so it could be that. Uh, it could be that we are uh, perceived as non-mainstream uh, by the mainstream outlets, uh, the World Bank uh, and some mainstream feminist authors, uh, because we're critical of, uh, or authors, uh, feminist economics uh, uh, scholars are critical of uh, RCTs or instrumentalization, uh, smart economics uh, ideas. Um, and on the heterodox feminist economics side, uh, maybe if he's uh, seen as mainstream, too mainstream. So <laughs> there, is, there is this. Um, now, why does it matter? I mean, of course, I mean, there's this saying, this quote, uh, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. Right? So, I mean, feminist economics may not get the credit, though we are influential. So that's great. However, you know, the reality is, of course, the impact factor counts for the advancement of careers of feminist economists. And so it is important that we get cited. I mean, our impact factor is rising, of course, but it's not, it could be rising much more rapidly than it is. And, and so this is part of the problem. And, um, and of course, you know, basically to advance the goals of feminist economics of improving lives, we, we need to have staffing improved at the, uh, you know, influential level of organizations as well as in tenure granting institutions and so forth. There is also the issue of, for example, the gatekeeping organizations such as the chartered um, what is the Chartered Association of Business Schools in the mm -hmm. UK? Uh, I mean, that's one example where they are kind of ranking journals to make sure that, you know, uh, um, promotions are based on, you know, the journals that are ranked highly and so forth. And, and we were in 2015 ranked, um, uh, ranked uh, or downgraded, I guess, to a level where uh, it, our journal, publishing in our journal would not count towards promotion. So, so this could affect not only submissions to the journal, but also possibly citations to the journal. So, so this is, you know, one, uh, one challenge, and I'm, am I done out with my five minutes? <laughs> yeah, I have five minutes, okay. There is also the methods challenge, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, feminist economics articles are predominantly Rely, they rely on quantitative <laughs> methods, and uh, and of course that may perpetuate our identification with the mainstream. Um, this is not surprising given our training, of course. Uh, however, the trend part is the surprising part because feminist economists from the early on, uh, early on, have actually advocated for more pluralism of methods and uh, more use of qualitative evidence. But contrary to that, the publication record shows that we are facing increasing number of quantitatively oriented articles. And, and I think um, there's our, I mean, partly these are due to successes of feminist economics. In other words, there is the, uh, you know, uh, more gender averse scholarship has been endorsed by the World Bank publications, for example. Uh, and the emphasis, though, is on causality 
uh, and therefore more quantitative analysis is required. Um, there are more data sources that are available and uh, so these are for example, time use surveys, DHS, um, demographic health surveys, uh, wealth data. So these are all lending themselves to quantitative analysis that feminist economists care about. Um, and then there may be, uh, of course, the inadvertent effect of, of the journal's guidance. Um, you know, we have on the website um, the Miller and Rogers article, <coughs> which is how to do good statistical analysis and reporting that's on the website. Uh, we also have helpful hints uh, for authors, which again outlines, uh, we have a PowerPoint there from 2012 on, uh, on how to do, uh, how to publish in feminist economics. Though the PowerPoint on the IFE website on publishing in feminist economics, which is from the Galway 2016 um, uh, conference uh, uh, pre-conference workshop, there um, I do identify interpretive methodologies as one option in addition to quantitative methodologies. But, but this could all sort of amount to a, a, um, um, a sort of a prioritizing quantitative, and, uh, uh, quantitative methodologies. I want to add that though, um, you know, if you actually look at the trend, the trend has actually peaked the trend in terms of share of econometric mm -hmm. articles in the journal in 2010, 2012, and then it's been sort of, a, there's a downturn. And just browsing the recent issues in the last two years suggests actually it may have dropped even further. So that's sort of good news. I'm not against really quantitative analysis, but, but really more kind of exploiting complementarities and showcasing, you know, basically having more relevance and then rigor in the journal represented, and sometimes rigor gets in the way, mm -hmm. technique gets in the way. Um, I don't know, I don't have time, so. Um, but let me highlight, and we can come back to this, uh, we have not, the pluralism of thought challenge is one. Uh, I don't think we have, uh, been successful in having articles that are um, from heterodox feminist perspectives represented in the journal. And then the diversity channel uh, challenge, of course, was already highlighted uh, by uh, a number of my uh, co-panelists. But there is there, uh, again, there's a methodological issue there. Uh, if we really want, um, if we only want quantitative data uh, analysis, then of course we hit the data constraints in, in sort of intersectional analysis and uh, you know race, uh, class, gender, intersections, the data are not there to conduct this kind of analysis or the sample sizes are too small and, uh, and there could be of course perception problems of the journal as well there. So I'll stop, I'll stop with these. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, one last question for uh, on this one will be put to all of the panelists is turning and looking towards the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what opportunities or possibilities does the journal confront at the present moment? And what new directions would you recommend we take? I'll start with Cece. Oh. You want me to start? <laughs> I can start with Carmen. Yeah, why don't you just go Carmen. across the way? Yeah. Yes, why don't you start? <laughs> Okay, again, focusing on, on the global south and <laughs> how to continue to, um, to expand uh, the kinds of articles or the, um, uh, where we're uh, receiving submissions. Uh, you know, one of the, the main challenges is always the, is the non-English speaking world. And for a while, the journal had a, a policy of accepting, uh, we would review papers in Spanish and maybe French. In French, yeah, and we did Spanish. Briefly, for briefly German, maybe. Yeah. The but then we discontinued it. And and yeah, vaguely recall it was we didn't have sufficient. We didn't have reviewers for all topics. We were only could only selectively review some papers. Yeah. It was a problem. You know what I remember is that you know I went through a period where I learned more about the Spanish economy than I ever wanted to <laughs> know <laughs> because I'm bilingual, but my interest really is solely Latin America. You know, so I really expanded my my thinking as a result of this process. But I think we do have, in a convoluted way, a unique opportunity, in the sense that. One of the major trends in Latin America that I believe is also uh, 
uh, representative or going on in, in Asia and perhaps at elite universities in Africa is this whole convergence of what's considered uh, measures of um, excellence in academia. You know, and it's all coming back to journal impact factors, um, having to publish in journals that are part of the Web of Knowledge or Scopus. And, um, and in Latin America, this has really transformed universities. It's put the fear of God in everyone. Because it primarily means that you have to publish in English. And unless you've done your PhD, you know, in the Anglo-Saxon world, you're not well equipped to actually meet that. So I'm thinking that it might be time to, to reconsider that policy again. You know, I think our reviewer base, and at least in Spanish, has, has grown over the years yeah. as we've had That's more submissions from, uh, from Latin America. And to be able to submit and be reviewed in your own language, it's just it's such a, it makes such a difference. You know, I've really seen it a lot sort of uh, firsthand. But, you know, this opportunity, the, I think a moment of great interest uh, among folks, at least in Latin America and publishing um, in the U.S., means that you need two things. Uh, funding for translations, which folks at poorer universities you know, do not have, and good translators. You know, and that's as much a barrier as, as anything, because there's nothing worse than a poor translation. So we have to think creatively in terms of, you know, of ways to, to facilitate that, that process. But uh, the first step would be you know, a good discussion um, among the, the journal editors and associate editors about um, maybe trying that again in this new moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nancy, same question. I think uh, uh, what Gonzali laid out as the the tensions between uh, kind of the being stuck between the kind of the mainstream and the heterodoxy. I think that's sort of the central uh, issue, and I kind of think it's an issue that needs to be addressed by the younger generation uh, mm -hmm. rather than than us here, uh, mm -hmm. because it's a, a really important strategic question that has a lot of bearing on uh, the careers of people who are mm -hmm. who are up and coming in the in, in the field I guess personally I think um, that if we don't kind of reassert our interest in uh, intersectional issues economic justice and economic theory that we, we will lose our identity mm -hmm. uh, I think we will be swamped personally I think we will be swamped by um, kind of the uh, formulaic em empirical uh, strategies that have come to dominate the profession and I I think that would be actually a worse outcome uh, for us than uh, you know than going going to the opposite extreme but again I think that is I, I think that's something that needs to be we need to hear more voices in that in that discussion. Diana. Uh, yeah, I um, I want to. I, I had this idea early on uh, when I was trying to get f attention to feminist economists of, and this was just with panels to have a panel where there would be like some super famous people participating. You know, if not a Nobel Prize winner, somebody close to it. And then to also put on that panel someone whom nobody would otherwise ever listen to. Mm -hmm. um, I called it sort of like a stealth feminism <laughs> sort of type of panel. And I, I think that feminist economics is somewhat in the same kind of place um, in terms of the tensions that it experiences. Because to the extent that we work hard to broaden our participation, Many of the people who we are including are interested in what I think, Nancy, you might call more formulaic um, empirical work, but it's empirical work about people in the lives you know, of th that matter to the people who are submitting to us. The, the challenge is that um, how can we include work that 
may not have the attention even of, fem of core feminist economists, but really um, we're being hypocrites if we don't try to direct our attention to this work when we ourselves have been excluded by a core in-group previously. And yet, if the journal can't maintain an impact factor, it, it, people can't be rewarded and recognized and deemed legitimate for publishing in it. So it truly continues to be a balancing act. And um, it's something that we will have to be constantly revisiting to see, you know, how can we do the challenge? There was a scholar who's been one of our top most cited scholars, whom I won't name, who had sort of announced she would never publish in us again because we had slipped in this particular impact factor thing. And we figured out a way to, um, um, I say we, but I really mean Alyssa. Um, <laughs> I'm back claiming falsely for some credit there, but to, to get her to um, write an article for us that would enhance our cited impact. So it's this, so there's basically a lot of work involved. The other thing that can help articles that might otherwise not be read or seen as, as important is to have more editing help from the core journal office, but that requires um, funding. Um, much of the work that we've done that has been the most highly <coughs> cited has been our special issues, mm -hmm. but to publish innovative special issues is really, it's a grant-making treadmill, I mean a grant-seeking um, seeking. Seeking. Seeking mm -hmm. treadmill, mm -hmm. trying because, you know, pl that landscape is always changing, and it involves a ton of work. And at the same time, another challenge that we're, we're confronting is that, um, the rise of open access, which in some ways should be something that feminist scholars celebrate, on the other hand, has the potential to um, um, change the finances of journal publishing in a way that it's not clear if that's going to help us continue to get the funding that we need in order to support an operation where we're able to do the same level of work intensive journal editing. Uh, so um, I'm going to leave it at that. I think that this is a continuing issue. Good selling. Okay. Opportunities. <laughs> Opportunities. <laughs> um, okay. I think we have to um, uh, revisit, um, you know, and reaffirm the goals of feminist economics. And I guess this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing project, but uh, at this moment as well. So early on, we we several of us claimed that feminist economics was good economics or an economics for all, and uh, and and so this uh, basically meant pluralism, broadening methods, broadening models uh, and pedagogies and so forth. So um, now if we, so we have to constantly ke keep this pluralism alive is one point, but uh, if we, if I can sort of quickly read from the feminist economics website, the goal of feminist economics is not just to develop more illuminating theories, but to improve the conditions of living of, for all children, women, and men. So this has two dimensions that I would like to talk about. One is uh, obviously the theorizing part, uh, and uh, and the uh, and the second is the. Uh, making change part, right? And these are essentially, there's a political goal here, but there's also a theoretical goal here. And that theoretical goal seems to be uh, kind of waning in terms of the representation of the published articles. So this is, I think, a challenge in that we would like the journal should support and actively seek more theoretical contributions and methodologically become more uh, pluralistic. And this could be done, because uh, otherwise, as Nancy f was saying, I mean, we could be really swamped by the mainstream. Uh, and so this could entail continu continued diffusion of the editorial teams with non-economists and, and uh, non-mainstream feminist uh, economists. Uh, obviously, special issue outlets in terms of, uh, or symposia in terms of uh, 
uh, methods uh, discussions could be important. A pre-conference workshop on, uh, on qualitative methods could be part of that discussion. Um, the second, defini second part of the definition involves uh, a very inclusive definition, improve the conditions of living for all children, women, and men. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a very lofty goal, but does it overlook issues of intersectionality? Um, I mean, there are obviously, I mean, we need to acknowledge that gender intersects with class and race, and there are conflicting interests. I mean, you can't simultaneously improve everybody's well-being. And, uh, and uh, I mean, you can try to, but. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so the journal could, sort of more actively confront this issue, again, intersectionality issue, uh, and strive to improve the well-being of people from the most vulnerable groups. So that might take, that might mean taking bold action in kind of maybe uh, special issues that focus on the most um, pressing issues of our time that are not maybe immediately in the purview of feminist economics, but you know, refugee crisis, uh, crises that are fueled by war and ec ecological crises, right? And what do we do to uh, get to an ecologically and socially sustainable future? That could be a focus of, of a feminist economic special issue where feminist macro is central because it's not just gender aware macro, but we need also ecologically aware macro. Uh, and um, so, uh, so these are, you know, essentially, uh, w the journal has to re remain relevant, and uh, and so these are some of the issues. And of course, rise of populist, sexist, white nationalism, authoritarianism—that's the, the most pressing issue, right? But I mean, how, what do we have to say on those issues? And. Um, we face, of course, the challenge of who's going to fund such a special <laughs> issue, uh, obviously. But you know, we have to be bold and uh, and keeping relevant. And um, and one other issue is, I think, I would highlight is that we need to guard against uh, too much technique featured in the journal. And um, you know, I mean, like I was browsing over the latest uh, issues, and I saw a, a an article with 11 tables of robustness checks in the article after the results are already reported. So I mean, this is something we should avoid. I mean, that would be this off-putting for anyone to kind of you know, pick up and read that article, even though the content is just so relevant and exciting. And um, so I would suggest maybe re looking at the Cambridge Journal of Economics editorial policy, where basically, I mean, in, in a nutshell, when mathematics is used, the major steps in the argument and the conclusions should be made intelligible to a non-mathematical reader, and authors should put part of mathematical parts of their argument into an appendix. And so this could be for all you know, econometric results for that, for, for, for that matter. So anyway, these are some, some suggestions uh, to reclaim good economics for <laughs> feminist economics. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Uh, Cece, yes. opportunities. Yes. One of the things I think we've heard outlined in the comments so far is that there's a tension between two goals. One is is trying to define a path-breaking, innovative new paradigm uh, for economics. And the other is trying to create an, a publication that will help people get tenure or recognition, mm -hmm. largely within the confines of a pr traditional economics profession and the rules that have been established there. Mm -hmm. And we st the examples, just one after the another, uh, continue to, to pop up. I want to add to that, in fact, a, a third piece, which Diana alluded to, and that is that there is a lot of change happening in the nature of scholarly communication, mm -hmm. that economics as a field is behind them compared to the rest of the world and the rest of the disciplines that are out there. And uh, so that is another piece to that kind of puzzle. So I want to talk about that just a little bit in a couple of, of examples. Uh, one has to do with what we've talked about, this focus on impact factor 
uh, can sometimes lead to choices about what directions, what's, what are things that we'll do special issues on, what are the types of articles that we should be publishing, uh, all of these which are understandable because we have tried in a fairly short period of time to move this from a nothing journal to having an impact factor uh, that could get included, even, even though recently it was downgraded, mm -hmm. in things like the, the example you cited from, mm -hmm. from England. But I worry that in doing so, it, had, it can steer us away from perhaps being truly innovative and open to a completely different type of framing of how scholarly research gets communicated and written up. And I think this goes back to your point about empirical tables and all mm -hmm. of these or, and so forth. So there, for me, that is a, a, a challenge that we, it may be time to confront, and maybe we should be at a point where we could start to talk about does feminist economics also have implications about the form of scholarship and scholarly communication that we may want to interrogate. One piece of that and an ongoing concern that I've had is that feminist <coughs> economics sometimes appears to exist in a silo apart from some of the other feminist work that is happening. We have made efforts to bring interdisciplinary scholars in to publish in feminist economics. It strikes me that the direction, the other direction of communication has been incredibly limited. Mm -hmm. And in, even in terms of citations, I think feminist economics doesn't get picked up in some mm -hmm. of those journals mm -hmm. as much as I think it should. I'll see things written and I think, well, they should really have cited this paper or had some mm -hmm. interest in this paper. And it seems as if, uh, for whatever reason, and some of it may be the barriers in the language and, and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, it goes into, we've said that, that uh, we're not radical enough for mm -hmm. heterodox, <laughs> we're Amazing. seen as, as heterodox by the mainstream, and then mm -hmm. I think people outside of economics for where I would hope more interdisciplinary communication would happen uh, to see us as too much economics for them to actually engage. And I would love to figure out ways to uh, break down those barriers over time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the, the changes in scholarly communications, the, the move towards open access has implications because increasingly, uh, I, as I have talked to people, what I found is that the they cite what they can access. <laughs> and particularly, I think, when people are going outside of their discipline. So it is a concern down the road as to uh, whether, how quickly should we move to make more and more of our, our um, content available given the challenges of the economic model that, that some of the, the, um, the subscription rent basically flows back to help sustain the publication. Thank you. So we have about a half an hour left. And so I what I would like to do is to open it up to the audience for questions and comments. We'll collect a series and then return to the panel for closure. So who would like to ask a question, make a comment, respond to one of the questions that was asked? Yes. And could you please identify yourself for the um, I'm from NYU Shanghai, uh -huh. based in China. They do research on gender and policy in China. Um, and sort of classically trained. Um, my question is, there was a comment about not being too uh, focused on the traditional empirical methods. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, there's a lot of like big data <coughs> learning and other kinds of methods that are very non-traditional, but they're on the cutting edge of empirical work. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what, the attitude is on you of this kind of work, mm -hmm. or the methodology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others. Yes. Uh, so I'm Rebecca Gomez from the University of Lyon in France. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have a lot of questions that <laughs> let me only uh, maybe two, two, two or three. So. Um, one question is uh, about the strategies if you had or if you are thinking of, um, for other uh, system of evaluation of journals in other countries. 
I, I'm thinking uh, in particular, for example, in France, feminist economics journals is very well ranked because we have our own uh, mm. system of evaluation of journals. So uh, when I think in the, in the journals in history of economic thought, many of editors have linked with the people in the national system of evaluation of journals to keep very well ranked these journals. Mm -hmm. Did you have any strategies mm -hmm. to keep in other countries like very well ranked the, the, your journal? Then the scholars want to publish and send submit the articles to your journals. Mm -hmm instead to submit of a more economic uh, journal, general journal. The second question, if is you, are, you don't think that it's important to keep a link with the master and PhD programs, or I mean, or to keep an eye on the scholars writing dissertation on feminist economics around the world, because I, I'm always comparing with histo history of economic thought that is my discipline, mm -hmm. and for us, it's very important the link with PhD programs and the dissertation in history of economics and then the, the journals in history of economics. Because these young scholars that are very productive, that are writing dissertation in history of economics, then they can publish in, in the in feminist economic journal. And maybe the, the last comment is like, with the, one of our journals in, in history of economics, that is the Journal of the History of Economic Society, uh, the Journal of the History of Economic Thought Journal, published by Cambridge, <coughs> uh, we are doing now, we are just, uh, the, the two editors, uh, Jimena, uh, Jimena Utado and Pedro Garcia Duarte, they are starting doing a series of short videos to present the result of the of the articles. Mm -hmm. Then they do the publicity of the articles, then you want to read more. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is something that you can do. But thank you for your presentation. For, it was very interesting. So maybe I can ask a question that came up in some of your responses. Um, and, and I'd also be interested to hear what the audience might have to say about this. But the, the conversation that we've been having around the tension, uh, on the one hand, right, one part of the project of the journal, I think, is to also enlarge the tent of who is doing feminist economics. Mm -hmm. And we've been almost too successful in, in some <laughs> respects because the submissions, the number of submissions that we get have really increased quite a lot. Um, and a substantial proportion of, of those submissions are from folks who aren't that familiar with feminist economics. If there's a kernel of an idea there that is inter interesting, mm -hmm. uh, we will move it on to review, right, and work with the authors, um, but that's also a sort of intellectual mentoring to enlarge the tent. And I think uh, constitutes a contribution to the pluralist project, right, because pluralism doesn't just mean we're all heterodox, Pluralism means that you know there are also mainstream folks who are right contributing to the project. So in, in, in that sense, we're sort of a victim of our own success. But what, one of the things that I've also struggled with in terms of then how do you uh, um, manage right these submission flows uh, in terms of choosing what's get what gets published. So if the theoretical part of the project seems to be waning because of how many more empirical submissions we're getting, mm -hmm. does that mean then that this is a moment where we need to begin, and this is what I talk about, curating mm -hmm. what we actually publish mm -hmm. uh, and what constitutes a theoretical contribution to feminist economics. Right now, we have a very sort of what I think of as a feminist review process mm -hmm. Uh, that is, is not about that kind of macro curation. Uh, so uh, I think special issues, and it's very interesting you know, that everyone has, has um, mentioned them, is one way mm -hmm. of creating this kind of theoretical space, mm -hmm. right, and inviting people to contribute. And I think that that, uh, uh, and, and that, that is an important method. But in addition, I would, uh, 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 are there additional ideas that you all have around that to sort of strengthen or shore up these theoretical contributions while maintaining our pluralist uh, identity? <laughs> so other 
uh, questions or comments. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Leonora. I'm from Australia. I'm visiting from RMIT University Melbourne, and I'm based at the European Public Policy Program at Harvard for India. I'm I'm mainstream trained. I think I've been on this evolution where I found feminist economics later in my training <laughs> and felt comforted by it in a way. <laughs> Realised it it was articulating something that. I previously felt uneasy about. I would like to ask you more about this intersection between mainstream and feminist economics. And if, what what topics, what issues do you think mainstream economics really needs to pay more attention to and can learn from feminist economics in more ways? You mentioned the refugee humanitarian issues. On my mind, I'm also thinking about domestic violence against women, which is not being yeah. given the attention it needs. Is there a way that you can perhaps visualize feminist economics kind of either overtly or subtly trying to infuse what is happening in mainstream economics so we can address those issues in more effective ways? Okay, one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I have a couple of really brief things to say. I want to much louder. One of, the, one of the questions I have is about special issues. Because they're funded differently, it seems like they're more extensive to put together. And they also, I've, I've done some analyses of RRP, the special issues of women, political economy, and women in there. And they also, in that case, were extremely innovative and at the same time still kept that content out of the regular issues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they can have a, a sort of reverse effect. At the same time, there were there were amazing collections of work. You know, there. So uh, that's one question about special issues. Another one is just uh, an insight from medical journals and public health journals. They often have a, ver a real variety of sections. So they may have a theory section, and they have like a set of small viewpoints or editorials or whatever. So there might be a way of having mm -hmm. components of the journal regularly, mm -hmm. so there would always be you know, one or two theory pieces or something like that. Uh, and the last one is that I've been looking at feminist economics for the last 20 years, uh, <laughs> and I feel like there's often a collapsing of quantitative and empirical, but qualitative is also empirical research, yes. and medical journals mm -hmm. also have guidelines, cloths have guidelines, mm -hmm. for example, on rigorous qualitative research. Mm -hmm. And that might be a, something mm -hmm. to add so that um, there's more confidence in some of the quality of the being rigorous. And at the same time, I don't say that at the expense of having good interpretivist and theoretical work either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we should yeah. respond. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. <coughs> Who yeah. would like I, to? Diana? I, I want to just comment on one thing, which has to do um, with advice that our publisher g gave me very early on when we began thinking about special issues. And, and I don't know if that advice still holds, but I, I took it very seriously, which um, also potentially implies to the issue of, of curation, um, which is that if people don't feel, if they submit an article to the journal, that it's got a, you know, a decent shot at being taken seriously, they won't submit. Mm -hmm. And so if you have too many special issues, no matter how wonderful they are, and they're not necessarily in that person's area, then you close off a whole lot of people feeling that this is a likely outlet for their research. Um, we, in, in terms of thinking about curation um, you know, and what it means, I mean, it's with the burgeoning of the submissions, you know, we are getting over 200, I mean, it, it's like, what, tripled recently. It's just extraordinary. And um, so it, it's not, we're not in the same place we were at an earlier stage as the journal has matured. And um, more and more stuff is just, it's a lot easier for people to submit. They don't have to mail stuff and make copies and all of that. Um, but so it's inevitable that there has to be some decision at the editorial level that this is stuff, you know, like w what is not appropriate or should be sent elsewhere mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. 
but to the extent that that we close off the journal from being a place where people can submit independently and have and feel like it's a a forum that is open to new work in whatever form whether it's intersectional or whether it draws on big data or some other area that we need to be very careful about what we are signaling and um, you know and in terms of you know the issue of like which societies count feminist economics as a good journal or not a good journal I just want to say since it may have get lost here but that our impact statistics are the highest they've ever been mm -hmm. so we've been on a steady upward trajectory you know for you know really since the beginning but it's getting better and better mm -hmm. um, but linking with um, you know trying to figure out how to lobby <coughs> organizations in specific countries about how they do it what's really become clear to me is there's a lot of misogyny involved mm -hmm. I mean let's just face it mm -hmm. there there are people who think if you've got the word feminist in the title even if you've, you've got a higher impact factor than some other journal that mm -hmm. they're rating higher it's they're, they're just going to downgrade it and, and I it, I think it's there's so much that the editors do or have to have on their plate that to figure out how to gain yet another um, system that's got you know part of the patriarchy <laughs> is going to be a challenge mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> sure um, so I guess I'll piggyback on the last point that Diana made uh, I mean in the case of the downgrading in the UK uh, by this um, ABS organization, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, actually, with the help of the publisher, actually put together an argument and made the case to the ABS uh, why you know feminist economics should be ranked higher. Um, but in the end, in 2018, they still kept us downgraded in our rank. So, uh, I mean, it's misogyny, essentially, I think, because the case was made very strongly. And um, um, if I can move to other issues, mm -hmm. other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, big data machine learning. I think it is uh, exciting. It's pretty valuable, uh, but it is a, a a theoretical approach in the sense that you're mining the data uh, and you don't have mm -hmm. theoretical priors. So no feminist technologies per framework per se, even though it could be a question that's guided by feminist economics. So I think it could be a starting point for an examination using our, our broader methodologies, uh, empirical methodologies, as well as kind of guided by theoretical thinking. I mean, I, d I have, I, I've uh, supervised an undergraduate thesis on machine learning, uh, using machine learning techniques of sexism on Twitter by U.S. states. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but of course, you know, you can see all of this like different, you know, uh, states originating different number of sexist tweets, right? So there's a variation. So then, but then you're left, okay, that's a great starting point for an analysis of why is this the case that, you know, mm -hmm. Wyoming has so little and, you know, some other state has so much. Anyway, so I think it's an exciting uh, prospect, but I th I'm also cautious about the atheoretical nature of it. Um, in terms of, let's see, uh, uh, yeah, I think in terms of um, more, you know, how do we, I guess Alyssa's mm -hmm. question, uh, you know, how do we curate a uh, question mm -hmm. if we want more theoretical uh, contributions? And I would say we probably have to start with uh, looking at our editorial teams and diversifying them more mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the content we would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so more non-mainstream, uh, you know, scholars perhaps uh, would would help. Uh, and uh, so I, I would say that's in addition to special issue as a medium, which I have already st strongly emphasized. That's how we can probably achieve that. Uh, then uh, the question of uh, qualitative guidelines, uh, and I would I would totally agree. I think you know because uh, the journal currently has you know, more or less empirical, how to do empirical analysis in a quantitative way there. And it's missing, you know, mm -hmm. how to do the interpretive 
uh, methodologies and and I think that but the way to get there would probably be with us you know having a symposium published in the journal and then the process generates some guidelines to post on the on the website so that we're again signaling you know we're open to these types of um, types of contributions Nancy, yeah, yeah, I, I like uh, Gotelli's uh, suggestions. I, I don't think there's a choice between like laissez-faire and, cur and, and sort of Stalinist mm -hmm. curation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's really, it's great that we're getting so many submissions and what journals do when they get more submissions is they raise the bar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I don't think, I mean, let, you know, let's just r raise the bar. And one component of the bar is, is, is this journal, is this article, you know, does it fit with kind of the mission of our journal? And I think just expanding, increasing the kind of awareness <coughs> of associate editors of a set of criteria for um, uh, quality, basically, uh, in in all articles across the board, uh, would you know? It seems seems to me that that would work. And I think symposia are a really good compromise mm -hmm. uh, where you can. There you can curate with compunction. Yeah. You, you, uh, or, I'm sorry, without compunction. Without, without compunction. compunction. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, on some topical issues and theoretical issues and, mm -hmm. you know, more controversial issues and, you know, that, that could be a way of signaling, sending a signal about the, you know, uh, spirit of the journal mm -hmm. uh, without... Uh, uh, you know, kind of setting up a quota for different, you know, types of things or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I would really, yeah. I would actually like to have a little bit of that in the journal. It seems like that's been discussed in the past, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. hasn't it been tried in the past? I mean, there have been. We've had quite a lot of s symposia. symposia. Yeah, yeah, right. we have. We, but I mean, but, but I mean, it's. But you know, I'm talking about like symposia, like on, you know, kind of current maybe current issues like, you know, gender inequality and universal basic income or, right. you know, stuff that is kind of, you know, that is, that bespeaks our commitment to uh, political engagement mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, That's a great idea. Carmen, would you like to? Um, yeah, let me tackle a uh, different issue that came up in terms of uh, what issues we think the mainstream should be learning um, about. Um, yeah, I think Cheryl put her finger on it last night in the, the presidential address when she was focusing on the, uh, the quality of data. Um, I think that's another area where we really have really expanded and, mm -hmm. and influenced at least the international agencies that are funding the collection yeah. mm -hmm. and through the time use, the inclusion of asset stuff mm -hmm. now, et cetera. But one thing continues to drive me crazy that the mainstream economists don't even blink about, and that's using the head of household <laughs> as if it had any kind of meaning, social, <laughs> economic yeah. content, right? Because uh, still internationally, you know, headship is left to the subjective definition of the person being interviewed. So there's no one-to-one -one relationship between household composition or you know, really anything, right? So it's variable mm -hmm. without content. And I think what really undermines the gender analysis is using headship, you know, female headship as the proxy, you know, for mm -hmm. women's position or for, for gender analysis. So we've been making this point for, it goes beyond FE, probably 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and we've made some, uh, Headways, but but not enough. And I think that the message that your analysis is only as good as how it was collected, you know, really takes us back to whose voice is being reflected here. Uh, that perceptions really matter, and that there are gendered perceptions due to the social construction of men's and women's lives, what they do, how they earn their income who they relate to, who they get information from. You know, we have a long list of why, why that matters. So there's still a lot more to do. You know, so we also need to publish in the mainstream. You know, we can't just uh, publish in FE. <laughs>
Great, absolutely. Uh, I, I just want to add one thing. I, I feel like we didn't respond to your qu question about what uh, about what we would be telling the mainstream. Well, what feminists? I think you did. Yeah. yeah but yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'll just add one thing. Is I, I, I feel like I, I went to a really interesting session this morning on gender norms, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, I, I would describe it as a mainstream session because it's very oriented towards sort of empirical analysis of the sort of path-dependent consequences of gender norms over time. And really creative and really interesting and I thought really heartening, but not much explanation of how norms are formed or how political and economic power shapes norms. They're sort of take, like preferences in the old standard neoclassical model. Norms are sort of to just take it like they fall from the sky and then, yes. then they have these pernicious effects. There's no notion that, mm -hmm. that people get together and create coercive norms and impose them mm -hmm. on other people and to use institutions to empower them. It's the, that idea of collective action and understanding, trying to understand collective conflict, personally, in my opinion, that is what is most missing from the uh, mainstream paradigm. Mm -hmm. Cece, do you have Anything you'd like to add? I, I admit of picking up on that last question to having <laughs> the initial reaction of, well, they could cite us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it goes back to the point you were making. I'm struck how frequently ideas have infiltrated successfully, uh, but people have forgotten the source. And that is, that's concerning. <laughs> Can I yes. ask one last question? Yeah. I'm currently working, I teach at uh, one of the teaching institutions, a community college, and we are starting a program on social justice, and I'm trying to uh, help create uh, the materials for the course. And I was very surprised, because there's, there's not a good textbook out there from what I can see, but there's many different textbooks that deal with the issue. And and it was a, a, a very visible lack of the economic perspective. So there's lots of feminist thought there, mm -hmm. but there's hardly any economic lens. Even the very bare description of the course is hardly in economic sense. Mm -hmm. so that's why we kind of really have a, try to have an innovative approach because I can I cannot think how to think of social justice and not think about economics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings back this lack of communication or interaction between feminist economics and feminist philosophy, sociology, mm -hmm. psychology, mm -hmm. and that we are interested but the other sides don't seem to be so interested. How can we solve that to promote that interaction so that the economic lens is infused in these studies of social justice? So, have you, are you familiar with Martha Nussbaum's book, yes. Creating Capabilities? Yes, uh, okay. I read the book, but I'm familiar. Because that book, I think, does a great job showing how economic concerns are linked uh, to justice issues. I, I mean, I, I think it's very well done. It's much more readable than Sen's Development is Freedom. And it okay. uses the capabilities framework, which feminist economists have adapted. I'm not saying it's the last or only work in such way, but it, I think it does She's what you're. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, but I also I also want to respond to that. I think that remember there recently a couple of scholars did some work looking at feminist identified journals across disciplines, and feminist economics is actually was the the most highly ranked in terms of having multiple of. Uh, authors from multiple disciplines. So we publish stuff from sociologists mm -hmm. and psychologists mm -hmm. and historians and lawyers and economists. Mm -hmm. So I think and that... And they're on our we, associate we, editor and editorial board. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. my point yeah. isn't that what we're exactly. doing. We've done a no. lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's not reciprocated. I'm on the board of science. <laughs> right. Yes. And I swear, they don't, there's no material analysis of anything mm -hmm. in any of the disciplines. I mean, maybe some of the sociologists, mm -hmm. but... I I walk out of there and I don't even know what they were talking about. <laughs> but but yeah. mostly because, but I but I am convinced all of the disciplines are becoming more siloed. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is, they're right. very right. largely focused on what they think they do well. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I sit there and I think, what what could an economist, a feminist economist, add 
to this dialogue. I mean, I know what we could add, but mm -hmm. I don't know who's listening. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so in some ways, I don't know if it's our problem mm -hmm. as much as it is, sure. I, I, I think, well, I think there's well, I think there are many more fruitful efforts to do with sociologists yeah. um, and, and psychologists, but um, uh, I, 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 I'm really struck at the lack of thinking about any mm. sort of economic outcomes for women um, outside of their representation. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, just one question, when we're talking about this tension between heterodox uh, and mainstream, when do we, is it that mainstream is open just to one particular kind of feminist economics work that gets done, or is it more broad in terms of taking care of intersectionality and other things? Because if it is the former, then do we just see it as appropriating the space rather than really being open to what feminist economists have to say? Mm -hmm. I think it's appropriating. <laughs> I think it's appropriating. It's appropriate. I mean, you know, the. I mean, what we even published an article in Smart Economics mm -hmm. in uh, I think 2017 mm -hmm. uh, or 16. Uh, anyway, I mean, this whole co-optation of, uh, of of feminist ideas uh, is is a sort of definitely a trend, an outcome. And, uh, and you know, so basically, liberal feminist-oriented, you know, ideas get you know adopted and pursued, and you know anything that questions structural inequalities is not. And I think that's the you know the critique of the instrumentalizing approach of the World Bank, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a long history there. If we go back to invisible work of women, <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, I want to um, close by wishing Cece a happy birthday. <laughs> Yay! Bravo! 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 Bravo!